Okay, please join me in the gathering song. It's number 673 in your hymnal, Down by the Riverside. <laughs> to Bethany Christian Church. Uh, please tear the side of the bulletin and let us know who you are, if you're a visitor and who you came with, and if you have a special prayer request, put those on there, or an address change, and then put that in the offering plate. So we have a lot of announcements inside our bulletin. I'm just going to run through them quickly. Uh, the Stewardship Committee, did that change dates? It's going to be the 5th at what time? Wednesday at 2. So if you're on the stewardship committee, the Life After Loss Grief Support still meeting Tuesday night, last 6. Night. This is the last night, 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, there's a work day scheduled on January 8th. What time do you want that, Christy? 10? Okay. And that'll be to take down all the decorations. Okay. Uh, board meeting on the 9th and at 5 it's open to the whole church we it really uh, dawned on us when we were in worship committee meeting that maybe everybody doesn't know that anybody can come to our board meeting um, also if you're an elder or a deacon we need you to be there that's a uh, you're on the board for sure if you're an elder or a deacon and and we 
many people didn't know that that wasn't getting passed down so uh, the agenda on that day is going to be very important we're going to have new officer nominations volunteers and then we'll have our annual congregational meeting on January 16th at 1050 uh, the next worship committee meeting is 11 a.m. on the 12th so if anybody wants to join that you're welcome to join anybody welcome welcome so now we're going to have our prayer song i mean our call to worship song it's called our call to worship song it's day by day number 599 in the candle Join me in the responsive reading. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly being, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of God's name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. May the Lord give strength to God's people. May the Lord bless God's people with peace. Let us worship God. You speak, O God, and the oceans tremble. Their waters crest in waves that dash upon the shore. You speak, the heavens open. Thunder signals the rain that freshens the earth. You breathe and the leaves shudder. The trees of the forest bow to your majesty. You speak and the spirit descends on your people. We ascribe to you all glory as we worship in your name. Amen. 
So with those children and young at heart, please make their way down and also sing along with us, Jesus Loves Me. I'm sorry, children come down and young at heart sing. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. To be holy, speak oft with the Lord. Abide in Him always, and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing is blessing to see. To be holy, the world rushes on. Spend 
much time in secret with Jesus alone. I, looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see. Time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow the Lord, and looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, soon shall be fitted for service above. Thank you, Christy, for the plans and also for the good music. I want to say a thank you also. Uh, when we came up this morning, I thought somebody was breaking into part of the church. <laughs> Said it was Carol. herb out there working on the water. Thank y'all for working on that. Working on putting that heater in. You put that heater in this last week and I appreciate that. Thank y'all for that. And for those who do all the other little things that go on around the church, we appreciate them very, very much. Long list on our prayer needs and I'm going to mention a couple of them that I want you to mention also those that you in particular want to pick out. Most of you know that Betty Fugit did die this last week. She was a hospice patient for about a, about two weeks before her death. I, I did talk with Deborah, and Deborah is planning a memorial service in February. <clears throat> It'll be a Sunday in February, and she'll be buried in their graveside uh, back at Matador. So please remember them in prayer. That'll be on a Sunday, and at that Sunday I probably will have to have a substitute because I think she's planning the memorial at 2 o'clock up in Matador and so it's a graveside service so let's remember her in prayer as they plan that I know Don has had a hard week he did come up for our grief our life after loss and share with me and help me in setting up but a real week I know that, that bronchitis is really getting to him he's had a tough time with it so please remember him I didn't talk with Sarah and Patrick the last part of this week, did the first part of the week, but how are they doing? Has anybody heard? I'm sorry? She is. Symptoms are beginning to be alleviating. Okay. Yeah, it has. Keith Spraggins, I know I've mentioned him as a prayer request. He's still in El Paso and uh, still very, very serious condition, so please remember him. Dave Baum is making his recovery. I didn't get to talk with him this week. We got a little busy. So much has happening, but uh, I know that uh, he's still recovering from his foot. Who else do you want to remember? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So many. Yes. Oh, he did. Yes. Yes, I understand that. I understand that. But you betcha. Say that again because I can't hear it very well. Job. Phyllis Job.
Yes. Lynn Reed. Say that again. I'm sorry, y'all. The heater is a little loud out here. Say it again. Uh, Edmond, Oklahoma. All right. Gotcha. Up in Windsor. Yeah. Windsor. Alice Garrison. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else know people with COVID? <laughs> Gosh. More all the time. Hearing more all the time. Yes. God blessing and help. Yes, ma'am. You are. All right, Rita's going to be having some surgery the next couple of weeks. Pray that not only it goes well, but the scheduling works. I know that's a hard thing right now, just getting it scheduled. Okay, Rita. Thank you for mentioning that to us. Thank you for that. Appreciate that, Herb. Any others? All right, then, let's pray. God, we do love you so very much, and we ask your help. Our coming to worship, Father, is not only a discipline in our lives, but, Father, we ask earnestly, praying each time that we come, that you meet the needs of our lives in the ways uniquely only you can. And our prayers that are made during our worship time and also in our private time, Lord Jesus, are for those many who have desperate needs, and those needs are so very many, Lord. The time of the year that we're in, Father, and with the COVID that we're having to face, we ask earnestly your blessing and your help. Walk with us, Lord, and help us as we minister to each other, as churches do their best in reaching out. And Father, also as we wait upon you to accomplish what you're yet to accomplish in our lives and in the life of our nation and the world. You are the one who holds the whole world in his hands, Lord, and we trust you with that. What we pray today is that you might help us, Father, as we think about being your servants, think about serving you, and even imagine and allow our imaginations to open up to your word in imagining what you can do through us. We do love you so very much. We pray blessing upon the service. Empower us in the time that we spend together and in the fellowship that we have together, Lord, so very important to us. Now, even as you taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's prepare for communion.
all of it. Would you stand as we sing? Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to give of ourselves. Our offering is a part of that. Father, also our service to you is a part of that and all that we are and all that we do. We pray that as we reflect you to the world, work through us, Lord Jesus, and accomplish your great purpose. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. From the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a greater sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commanded as a righteous man. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith he still speaks, even though he's dead. By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was, commanded as, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith Noah, when warned about things yet not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and as good as dead, became descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. In the development of that which is called the righteous character in the scriptures, the righteous character of God in us, which really is the great promise of God, that he would develop that in us and develop it in the rest of the world too. The journey can be likened to a train, if you would. And I'm going to use that train illustration in the next series, several sermons. 
The engine of this train of righteous character of God is taking us somewhere. We work through discipleship. The coal car, it feeds that train. Discipleship is the feeding of us to becoming the character of God. And in the people mover that's being pulled, we fellowship with God's people, you and I, and other people, others who are in the body of Christ. And as a result, we develop that caboose, a new attitude. The scriptures help us to develop that new attitude of looking at life. In creating wisdom in us, he takes us to the throne of David, where the great wisdom of God is expressed through the ages. And with him, we are building the temple, now a temple inside of us, the temple within us. And the gifts of the Spirit are reflected through the body to us and to others. In creating a competence, a new way of looking at the world, he takes us to the holy place of Shiloh, that place which was really a tree at one time where the people gathered, where they gathered and believed that somehow the righteous character of God would bring them a balance between what was worldly and what is heavenly. We meet with God's people at Shiloh. This has become a Shiloh for us. Moses leads us in building that tabernacle, God tenting with us. That too is developed now within our hearts when we understand the full meaning of the Ten Commandments designed to build inside of us a character, not just be ten rules. In creating a purpose for us, we go to the written word and we understand that there is a dynamic of creation. Not only did God create, but God is still creating. We're called like Abraham to a new place to fully understand the purposes of the law. The law was given so that we might develop new character and now that law lives within us in creating us to be caring people. We become part of the church. We work to build the church. With John as our guide, we develop those beatitudes to our lives that help us to become and be what God has designed us to be. In creating love, we enter the Holy of Holies with Jesus, teaching the disciples to pray as he did the disciples' prayer. We pray that prayer every Sunday together, the disciples' prayer. In creating faithfulness, we raise our Ebenezer hither by faith. By faith we've come this far. With Jacob, we build an ark of faith. And Noah, build an ark of faith to carry us to express the fruit of the Spirit to all people. In creating willfulness, you and I make a decision of what we're going to do with the spiritual things of God. We do our part in climbing Jacob's ladder, or you may build another Tower of Babel instead, where people don't understand what the church is all about. We try like the judges to do it our way, but we fail. Like the churches of Revelation, we have to be disciplined back to find a new willfulness in serving God. And in hope, we enter the Holy Land with Paul looking forward as the book of Revelation tells us to that city where there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more trouble. One church called it God time, gather time, group time, and go time. I like that. God time is that which is getting you where you need to be. Gather time is when we gather with God's people and group together and do the work together and then go time is achieving the purposes that God has called us to do, to develop that righteous character of God. The purpose of the written word, the journeys of God's people in discipleship is to bring us to the place that we understand that fully. There's no guarantee that the righteous character will be yours or the church's unless Christ is the sinner. And if we allow him to be the sinner of our lives, he'll have his way with us. And that way he'll also have a way with the world. I'm amazed, and you are too, in the way in which God reveals himself often in ways that we never imagined that he would. I spent a series of messages and us talking about those stones on the, overlooking the river at West Point, developing character and becoming like God. But just because those stones exist and they're there on the side of the river near West Point doesn't mean that those soldiers inherit that. We've seen that of late even with all of the uh, scandal that's taken place at West Point as well as in other schools and in the military. One year at Hardin-Simmons University, I was amazed when we were working together at Christmas time. There were a group of guys that we had hired out of 
out at Hardin Simmons. We were students together, and they were helping me and putting out Christmas trees, selling Christmas trees, flocking Christmas trees. As we were cutting out the trees one day, there was a one gentleman that we had hired. He had been a great scout, been all the way, went all the way through scouts, gone to and done his eagle. He was a great scout. And he was talking about all of the training that he had received. And he said, you know, I'm on the orienteering team at Hardin-Simmons. I said, I didn't know we had an orienteering team. And he said, yeah, it's through, our, it's through the ROTC. There's an orienteering team at Hardin-Simmons. And he said, in fact, we just won the national championship. And for a moment there, I thought that he had lost his mind. And I said, you won the national championship. And he said, yes. We won the national championship in orienteering, the ROTC at Hardin Simmons. And I said, uh, when was this held? And he said, well, it was actually in Washington. And he said, uh, we were kind of surprised ourselves because we beat out West Point. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. You're either living in a fantasy world. Hardin Simmons University, this little school in Abilene, beat... <laughs> the Army beat West Point in orienteering? And he said, yeah. And he said, they thought they knew what they were doing, but they didn't. I said, well, tell me a little bit about it. And he said, well, there was a little difficult. They dropped us in an area, and we had to utilize what talents we had in orienteering our way back and to finding the shortest distance. And he said, we beat West Point back. He said, apparently those West Point guys can't read a map. <laughs> and I said, y'all didn't have your telephones then, did you? <laughs> no, we didn't have our telephones with us. We had to orienteer ourselves back. Being a church member doesn't guarantee the Lord's character in us. You know that also. God's character is not guaranteed. There is probably no greater disappointment to a believer then you and I and you, if you haven't experienced it, you will. Sad, yes, but nevertheless it's to be experienced where you get disappointed with a church member. One of the presidents of Hardin Simmons University at a uh, commencement address and a part of his address said, there is no greater disappointment and you will be no greater disappointed than the day that you discover that the person you have the most trust in is nothing but a scoundrel. I don't know what. Yeah, you have to say it again because it's kind of long, wasn't it? You don't understand what disappointment is or what faith is until the day comes that the person you had the most faith in, you discover that they're nothing but a scoundrel. Now that's a. I thought, man, that's a terrible thing to be telling these graduates as they graduate. No. It was a good piece of advice. Don't put your trust in people. Not first. Does it mean you can't trust people at all? Does it mean you can't have some kind of relationship? No. Those relationships exist, but ultimate trust must be in God. You put your trust in God, he won't fail you, but people will fail you. Maybe you've experienced that. I have. Most of you have. I'd venture to say that all of us have had trust or hope or belief in somebody and thinking that they would guide us and help us or that we thought that they would never fail and lo and behold they failed. I still recall and you will too the sense of shock and the sense of disappointment that there was and it was a crisis of faith for me when I was sitting together with a group of pastors and they announced that a good friend, he had been pastor of First Baptist Lubbock for a long time. In fact, he was the youngest pastor of First Baptist Church of Lubbock and was a great leader, very handsome, very strong-willed and very forceful and very evangelistic gentleman and I had great trust in him. And another good friend stood up and said, you know, he was preaching a revival in Abilene this last week. And on Sunday afternoon, he went out in front of his house and stuck a shotgun in his mouth and killed himself. Wow. 
And I remember the shock of sitting there and thinking, if he can't make it, how can I make it? If his faith can't help him through whatever it was that he faced, and I never learned what it was, and maybe it wasn't in particular thing, how am I to be able to face that? Now, since that time, it's happened more than once. It's happened many times, many, many times. Yesterday, I was comforting a man, and he called me, and he said, you know, Jimmy, we haven't had any Kairos meetings, and we haven't had any Maus meetings, and we haven't been preparing for any of the meetings that need to go on. And you know, those prisoners, they really need those Bible studies. And I said, yeah, they really do. I said, I'm sorry, I've, I've never been able to attend a Kairos I've tried a couple of times, but had to drop out because of scheduling, because it really is a uh, rigorous schedule to prepare yourself for Kairos. If you're familiar with Kairos, and that was teaching uh, the Emmaus uh, background, the Emmaus program in the prisons. And he said, well, Jimmy, it's been a tough year. And I said, yeah, it's been a tough couple of years. And he said, well, a couple of our friends that were leading us in the prison have killed themselves as a result of not having the meetings. And I said, whoa, wait a minute now. I said, you know, it's one thing to say it's because of not having the meetings. But that can't, you can't blame it on you guys. You can't blame it on the people who do try to organize meetings. We're not dependent only upon that. Do I rely upon coming to church? Do I rely upon my church family? Of course I do. I rely upon you. I rely upon the fellowship that we have. If we miss it, it means a great problem, means a great uh, uh, struggle for us if we miss it. You know that, and I do too. I miss it very much anytime that I'm not with God's people and we meet together. But if we did miss the meeting, if it didn't meet, well, would that be the end of life for us? Would we lose hope? Lose faith in God? It's got to go beyond just <laughs> words written on some stone benches. It's got to be implanted in the heart. It's a character has to be transformed. We have to experience the whys. It's good to know what Shiloh was. It's good to know what the commandments are. It's good to memorize the fruit of the Spirit. It's good to know what, uh, how God manifests himself in us. But to let him manifest himself in us is very different. Growing up in a church just down the road here, uh, at Sherwood Baptist, I was in the RAs, Royal Ambassadors. Got involved in Royal Ambassadors the same way a lot of other people did, and that was because of basketball. Got attracted to basketball, and they brought me in, and I started attending, had to attend the RA meetings in order to be on the basketball team. So I started attending the RA meetings, and one day in particular, one of the uh, leaders, he said, Jimmy, have you done that lesson, lesson number three? And I said, I'm not sure what is the lesson number three. <laughs> and he said, apparently you haven't. He said, lesson number three is that you memorize the fruit of the Spirit. I said, the nine fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Can, do you know them, Jimmy? And I started listing them off. And he said, finally, he said, you know, you're guessing. And I said, yes, I am. I said, because I didn't memorize them. And I said, is it not a little bit of a contradiction to memorize the fruit of the Spirit and not know what they are? And I said to that teacher, and of course I probably was impudent, not for the first time, aren't they fruit of the Spirit? Aren't they supposed to already be manifested in us? Or do we just memorize them? It was akin to a class one day at Hardin Simmons University. I still remember it's in my, my, name, uh, my mind right now. A, a religious education class taught by a great friend of mine. I loved him, and he was a great teacher. One day he was teaching all of the functions of the church. And of course it was the Baptist church. And that was what we were studying at Hardin Simmons was the Baptist church. And we were studying the functions of the church and the programming of the church. And we got to vacation Bible school and we're talking about vacation Bible school. And he said, now here on page three, page five, is the listing of the characteristics of a good vacation Bible school teacher. And I looked at them, and I looked at number two, and number two was act like a Christian in front of the kids. <laughs> and I said, is that, you got to be kidding me. You actually put that in the book that a vacation Bible school teacher ought to, during vacation Bible school time, act like a Christian in front of the kids? I said, 
But do you not see the ridiculous nature of that statement? <laughs> it's because you can't act like a Christian at the time you're supposed to be doing it, Claire. You keep acting like just a redeemed man. <laughs> there are some things that are supposed to be created in our natures. It's memorizing them is not a bad thing, don't get me wrong. I understand what those classes were designed to do, what they were trying to do, but the statement of it sounded so ridiculous. You know, I guess you're only supposed to act like a Christian during vacation Bible school time. And you're only supposed to have the fruit of the Spirit if you've memorized them. The fruit of the Spirit come out. They're supposed to be there naturally. That's what he's designed for us. Those lessons, am I making too much fun of those? I, I hope not. Because there is purpose in learning, but at the same time, there is reasoning and purpose behind uh, what they're teaching us. Shiloh wasn't just a place, it was designed to be a place where something would happen. When they gathered under that tree at Shiloh, if you can imagine it, they had no king at that time, it was just the judge's time. They would gather under that tree at Shiloh and they would say, we need to talk about what is truly meaningful and good and what is to come next. We need to thank and to praise God that he's brought us this far. We can't do it on our own. We're not just left with a bunch of rules to follow. We need the presence of God and the presence of God will make the difference. I wish, and I think if we don't do it here, we'll do it in the kingdom, we'll have opportunity and we'll have time then to be able to sit down and not only share our testimonies with each other, but also be able to sit down and to be able to share those moments when at certain points in time, God revealed himself to us and said, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to save you here. Times when we could not save ourselves and we desperately cried out to him, God, help me. And God did help us. All of us have some of those times. Most of them are in little things that we thought, you know, that's kind of coincidental. It's really not that great a significant thing, but it was a significant thing to us that God would help us when we were helpless. Let's pray. Lord, we do love you and we thank you for helping us when we're helpless and for bringing us that character that can't develop just by memorization, Lord, but develops in us because of experience with you. We experience the fruit of the Spirit. We experience the meaning of the commandments. We experience the armor of God. It becomes ours when we need it, Lord Jesus, and it makes a difference, and we certainly need it in difficult days. Be that for us, Lord Jesus. Be for us what we cannot be for ourselves and that we cannot be for other people. Do for us, Lord Jesus, as our leader and as our love, as our God and as our Savior, what we need for you to do. In a few moments, just contemplate that relationship you have with him as the music plays. If you want to sing along with it, then sing along with the song quietly. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river. Joy like a river, I've got joy.